Tool Man. You're listening to the No Schedule Man podcast with Kevin Bomer, exploring real stories and lessons learned with a variety of special guests. To learn more about Kevin and to access other episodes of the podcast, please visit NoScheduleman.com and connect and contribute at No Schedule Man on Twitter or Instagram and on Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud, all backslash No Schedule Man. Thanks for listening and enjoy the No Schedule Man podcast. I've been known to struggle with reality. It's not that it is any reason. The question today is, how much of you, the real you, and your story are you sharing? A few follow-up questions to that. How much are you holding back? What are you hiding or hiding from? And what do you think the effect is of all of that? Welcome. I'm Kevin Bolmer. Today, we're exploring the journey of Michelle Nuray, an international speaker co-author of The Great Crossover, and founder of Mo Mondays, a monthly variety show that combines storytelling, comedy, and live music, in which, since its creation in 2012, has expanded to multiple cities across Canada and in the United States. Michelle helps people craft and perform more effective, what he calls purposeful stories, to become more effective at what they do. He also uses purposeful storytelling to more effectively help organizations position and brand themselves in the marketplace. But of course, this podcast is mostly about the story, the journey of the guest. So in this case, it's Michelle Nuray. And I can tell you, this is a fascinating and thought-provoking story. I always think I have an idea of how the conversation with my guest is going to go for this podcast. And part of what I love about doing it so much is that I'm almost always wrong. (laughs) I really try to let the guest guide the conversation based on what they seem to want to talk about on that particular day. And then from there, I try to shape it, shape the conversation somewhat to connect some dots and get some of the pieces in there that I'm thinking that a listener might expect to hear. And in some cases, what I want to hear. Now, this conversation I thought about for quite a while after it happened. It surprised me, or parts of it surprised me. Michelle went places that I wasn't expecting that he would. And he actually told me afterwards that he never had had the dots connected from his story quite the way that we did together in this conversation that you're about to hear. I was really pleased to hear that he felt that way, and I'm grateful that he would share it with me, and I hope that you like it too. I always make notes when I'm talking to somebody doing this podcast, and I do that so that I can jot down things that kind of strike me as particularly noteworthy. Near the beginning of the discussion with Michelle, he said that he had a lifelong mission to, quote, let more of me out. And that really struck me, and I wrote that down. When you juxtapose that, let more of me out, with what he shares about his father and things that he only learned much later in life, Well, then that mission of letting more of me, meaning of Michelle, out, takes on a much deeper context. In other words, Michelle seemed to be born with an innate sense to do what his father could not or did not, even though Michelle didn't realize that's what was happening until he himself was well into his 40s. I find that absolutely fascinating, and I thought I'd point that out to you before the conversation starts with Michelle. It begs the question of of us, of you and me. What more of ourselves do we need to let out? Some of the key things I took from my time with Michelle Nere include, number one, a lesson from his mother. Never lose sight of the intense desire to see the good in people and the love in the world. He tells some really touching stories about how his mother was always able to see the ridiculousness in even the most dire of situations and how she related a a most unlikely story to Michelle about what she considered to be her funniest memory, which she shared with him right near the end of her life. Michelle said that she never lost sight of the love in the world and she never lost her sense of humor. And that's going to be thrown into a sharper context for you when you hear about what his mother went through. Please listen for that. Number two, a lesson from his father. Keeping your stories and experiences to yourself can eat away at you. No matter how brave and admirable a face you may be putting up, it can eat away at you. 
and grind away at your soul. Maybe that's something that you're experiencing right now while you're sharing this time with me. Well, keep listening, because Michelle shares some really remarkable stories and revelations that he had about his father, who certainly sounds like a remarkable man. He, his father, carried around inside of him what he kept from his son, I can only assume, to protect him. Now, how much of that may have affected his days here on earth, we'll never know. But Michelle's insights into the revelation of what his father really went through is touching and thought-provoking. Please listen for that. Number three, know what you want, but getting clear on what you do not want may be just as or even more important. So when Michelle came up with the concept of what became Mo Mondays, he had a pretty clear idea of what he wanted, but he also had a really clear vision of what he did not want. And as he says in this conversation, quote, by making the mistakes that I did, I got very clear on what I didn't want. Now, this is a terrific example of why you must allow yourself the process of learning and shaping your craft. Or as Doug Vincent said in episode 43 of this podcast, learn to do by doing. This is another really good one. I know you're going to love it. Here is the conversation exploring the journey of Michelle Nure on the No Schedule Man podcast. Michelle, when you were a boy, what were the kinds of things that you were dreaming about doing as you grew into adulthood? Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, well, when I was a boy, I, I wasn't quite going into adulthood so quickly. Uh, although we all, we all, I guess we all want to grow up fast, right? But I, I remember as a kid, I loved the process of invention. I, I really wanted to be an inventor. You know, everybody's, you know, what are you going to be when you grow up? Well, I, I wanted to be an inventor. Uh, and, I, and, and I was, I loved mechanical things and I loved seeing how things worked. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I you know, I was the kid who, who tried to, um, who, who tried to, who wanted to see what happened when, uh, when you put a, a DC light bulb against the prongs of, of a, of a plug half into the wall. Hmm. I, I'll tell you what happened. It blew up. <laughs> <laughs> but you're but still, anyway, got, you still got all your fingers though, right? I still, yeah. I'm still like, Whoa, what happened? I, I, I think I should be more careful when I do these things. <laughs> you know, I, like I was that kid. Uh, and, and, and I would, and I, and I was alone. Uh, I'm not going to say I was a loner because that makes it sound like terrible, but, but I was a shy kid. Uh, and I and I spent a lot of time alone, uh, uh, clearly an int introvert, and you know, always thinking, hugely curious uh, about how things worked, and 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 really observant of the people around me. Uh, but I was a shy kid, so I didn't didn't never had a lot of friends, and always felt a little bit awkward, and you know, all of that stuff. You know, I'm sure. To, you know, we all think that we're we're the only ones who feel this way, but you know, I know we're not. It's, it's actually a universal, uh, universal feeling or theme uh, with people. Um, and now, listen, there were there were things in my background that you know would you can look back now and say, oh yeah, you know, I understand why you felt different, but. But it's still a universal theme. Anyway, so you asked me what you know what was going on in my head. What did I want to do? And I, I really I wanted to. Um, in in retrospect, I have to say. I wanted to be. My lifelong mission was to let more more of me out. I'd have to say. Gee, that that was almost contra contradictory, or not contradictory, but not new, not related. But I think it. I ended up using my whole inventor curiosity to kind of do that, deconstruct the world and deconstruct myself and reconstruct it in, in, in ways that I wanted. What do you remember about thinking that for the first time, that thought of letting more of me out? How did that manifest for you? Uh, that, that really happened in high school. You know, probably the most awkward of all life stages for yeah. all kids. Uh, but I'd have to say that I was 
I started to get really, really fed up with myself. Uh, really fed up with holding back, really fed up with not playing full out, really fed up with 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 the role that I played uh, in my groups of friends that I hung out with, um, where I, you know, I, I, I would get attention by, by basically being, I was teased, I, I would be the butt of jokes and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go to the, I wasn't bullied or anything like that. It's not what I'm, but you know, you, it, you know, everybody takes on a persona in a group of people. And what I found was that in my group of friends, A, I didn't like it and B, I felt very stuck in it. And, and C, I was never going to change it as long as I had those friends because, you know, they, they lock you in there. You know, and, and again, I'm going to say, I don't think I was different in that respect. You know, we all take on certain roles with our groups of friends. And, and because of the dynamics of relationships uh, and, and people have expectations of you behaving a certain way and then they react and behave to you a certain way that keep you there. I just didn't like it. And, and I wanted to break out and I realized if I was going to do anything, I had to, I had to do something uh, drastic. I had to reinvent myself. I had to, I had to change all my friends. Uh, I was so excited when uh, I applied to university because there was no way I was going to university in my home city because I knew I had to change everything. And I did. Tell me more about the circumstances that led to that realization. And I asked that question, Michelle, from the standpoint of thinking that I would suggest, and I'm generalizing, but a lot of people that I know don't ever even make that distinction. They just let life sort of carry them along. Or they're more like me and get well into what you maybe would call midlife before waking up and taking a look around and doing the evaluation of, you know, you are like the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. And then you have the choice to either make a change or not. But there's a lot of awareness that goes with that. So to be able to do that in high school, what were some of the things that you were noticing that you didn't like or some of the things that you felt were maybe out there for you that you weren't quite getting to? Give me an idea of that context because I'm, I'm really interested in that level of awareness from a high school kid. Well, you're, you're making it sound like it was a real conscious awareness. And I, <laughs> there's no way I'm going to claim that, <laughs> uh, you know, most, m- much of this, you know, I recognize in hindsight, but I do, re- I do remember not being happy with myself. I do remember not being happy with the way that I was being treated by my friends. Uh, I do remember, uh, just feeling boxed in. Uh, yeah, but I think you know, that the big distinction is it sounds to me like you recognized those things but also felt like there was something that you could do about it as opposed to just being a victim and accepting it as, oh, well, this is my lot in life. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I, I, the, I knew I needed to do something. Uh, was I that aware that, you know, I actually, I don't think I had a cho- I didn't feel like I had a choice, to be honest with you. I just knew I had to change it. It's, it's, I, and I, and I, and I did. And, you know, it's interesting because, you know, I don't know if you've heard me ever me, heard me chat about, you know, Momondays and the founding of Momondays and how I tribute a lot of that to, uh, to the experiences of my parents during the Second World War. Uh, my mother was a Holocaust survivor. My father friend fought in the French uh, Foreign Legion, you know, both absolutely horrific experiences uh, and uh, and I didn't. I never 
attached that, uh, you know, I say that's, I mean, obviously, in many, many, many different ways, that the awareness of, of the experiences that my parents went through and a whole generation of parents went through during the Second World War influenced me a huge amount. And, and um, but I never attached that to this particular thing in high school, interestingly enough. I never, I never saw that until now. So thank you for asking the question. Um, you know, maybe it's even more pervasive than I, I thought it was. And, you know, and the, and the, and the story in a nutshell is, you know, my mother was a Holocaust survivor. She's passed away now. Uh, she born and, and raised in, in France and um, turned in by her schoolmates during the war, literally turned in. The Nazis came looking for her and, um, you know, was sent to Auschwitz, uh, barely, literally, barely survived. Um, and I grew up with a sense of never wanting to be embarrassed about who I was, never wanted to hide who I was. Um, and I, 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 I don't know if it's just a story that I, I tell myself now because it sounds funny uh, and, and convenient, but, you know, my parents, you know, I grew up, you know, my, so they, they moved to Montreal and uh, had to decide what school to put me in. And in, in Quebec, the province of Quebec at the time, uh, they were very, very clearly uh, kind of delineated along language and religious lines. Uh, French schools were Catholic, English schools were Protestant, and, and, and there was the Hebrew school, which was a private school, and of course you had to pay for it. My parents were not rich by any means. My father literally came to Canada with, with nothing, started over his life as a traveling salesman. And, uh, and they had to pick what school to put me in. They ended up putting me in the, in the, in the English Protestant school. They wanted to put me in the French school, but it just, you know, it was very religious. Uh, and, uh, they didn't want that for me. And so they put me in the English school. So here I was, uh, a little French Jewish kid in, in an English Protestant school in, in a French Catholic province. And it, it didn't matter which group of kids I hung out with. I, I was always the odd kid out. You know, I mean, even amongst my Jewish friends, I, they, they didn't get me. They didn't understand, you know, all of their grandparents sounded like they came straight out of a Woody Allen movie, you know, the heavy Eastern European accents and all that. And, and, you know, my mother was French and, you know, we, you know, we would sit in the gym at lunch and, and have our lunch. Everybody would have their peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and, and I'd have my roast beef, you know, rare dripping because my mother made it for me. Uh, but I, again, I think because, I had this very strong sense, you know, of, of what had happened to us in the, in the grander sense of the word during the war. Uh, first of all, it gave me a huge amount of, of empathy and this curiosity about how people can be so evil to anyone, cruel to anyone. Um, but also uh, this notion of never again and, 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 Never again means, you know, never trying to hide who you are. And I, I took that personally. And, and uh, anyway, so th I think there might be a relationship to my awareness in high school of when I, like, I just did not want to be that kid. I didn't want to be that person. So I, I changed. When you 
give the background that you have of your parents and the description of what your mother went through looking back on some of the things that you've said that I've written down, it throws it into a completely different context, Michelle. You know, you said it's been my lifelong mission to let more of me out. Uh, had to reinvent myself, grew up with a sense that I never wanted to be embarrassed about who I was. It, it almost seems as if you have kind of lived this spirit, not on behalf of your mother, but as an extension of that to, almost in a way of recognizing and honoring what your parents went through and just making a commitment without even necessarily, it sounds like consciously choosing to do that, um, that, 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 um, that wasn't going to be part of your story. And that, uh, because you were telling me before we even started recording about how many people are surprised to know that by nature, you are an introvert, <laughs> not exactly the thing that people would necessarily uh, think of with somebody with, um, with your list of accomplishments and credentials, but um, it seems as if almost like a bird has a sense of just it can't help but know where to go and when to migrate. You can't help but be pushed just a little bit beyond your comfort zone by your very nature. Yeah, I, I, I'd have to say that's, uh, that's, that's an insightful uh, comment. Uh, listen, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you've heard me tell – the story of Mo Mondays, but I do share that I believe there's a lot of my parents in Mo Mondays. I, uh, and on, on, on a number of levels, you know, first of all, there's this notion that we were just talking about, about just really allowing more of ourselves out. And we, and we do that through sharing our stories. Uh, there's also, the note, like my mother wrote a book and it's a very good book. I will say about her experience in Auschwitz. Uh, it's called to Auschwitz and back. And we, we, in her honor, we did a website for the book called to Auschwitz and back.com. And, uh, and that as difficult as it was for her to share that story, First of all, it was hugely cathartic for her, as you could imagine. And, and you know what? Listen, th these experiences affect people in hugely different ways, and there is no one right way to deal with it. I'm only coming at it from, from the way that I saw my mother deal with it, and, and I'll contrast it after with the way that my dad dealt with his experience. But my mother never lost her her, her intense desire to see the good in people, to see the love in the world. She never, ever lost that. And if you read the book, you'll, you'll see it's not a grim account of what happened, although it is a grim account of what happened. But it's not a grim account. It's, it's, it's probably uh, one of the more uh, uplifting and, and, uh, and inspiring stories uh, because she never lost sight of of the love in the world and 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 the beauty in the world. She also never lost her sense of humor. And uh, funny thing, you know, my mother passed away a few years ago, and my wife, bless her, said, "Michelle, spend as much time as you can with her because you'll never have this opportunity again." So I did. We would spend hours at the uh, What's it called? Anyway, I was sitting with her in the hospital on her, on her, on her, literally on her deathbed. And, uh, you know, she was going in and out of consciousness and, and sometimes she'd be incredibly lucid. And other times I don't know if she knew I was there. And one of the times when she was lucid, I said, you know, Ruth, and we called her Ruth, Ruth, you know, what, what's the, what's the funniest thing that ever happened to you? And I don't know why I asked that question. It just popped into my head because we'd run out of everything else. And I remember reading somewhere that, you know, ask your parents, you know, before they pass away that, you know, the, the, the simple questions. So I said, what's the funniest thing that ever happened to you? And she kind of, it was really weird. Uh, and, and she kind of like propped herself up in her bed and sat and her head tilted a little bit. And she said, well, we had just arrived at the camps 
I like, I like, you gotta imagine what's going on in my head. I mean, I just asked her, what's the funniest thing that ever happened to you? And she's not talking about summer camp here. She's talking about, you know, the extermination camps. And she's going to tell me a story about what happened at Auschwitz. And she, and she saw the quiz, she saw the quizzical look in my face. Like, huh? <laughs> and she says, yes, yes. We had just arrived at the camps. And the capo, now you got to understand, the capo is the is another prisoner who is elevated to the position of guard, you know, and they had a truncheon that they were walking around with. And, and you know, they had to be the meanest of everybody because every day they had to prove to their, you know, Nazi, uh, liter- the real guards, that they were worthy of this position. So, you know... Capo pointed her stick at me and she says, and she says, you know, clean, clean the the pails, clean the latrines, put them over there. And she points somewhere off to the side. And so my mother's telling me this story. She says, I got my friend and, you know, we got the pails and we're walking over. We've got a pail in each hand and it's, you know, spilling on our feet and, walking and we're just going and we and we spill it out to where we think the capo told us to to spill it and all of a sudden to Danku she says in French I have the baton on my head on les épaules and on my back and I fall to the ground and the shit is flying all over the place <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I look up at the capo and she's got a bandage over one eye and she's looking at me and she's pointing her stick at me and she's shouting in Polish. And all I can understand is the word punishment. And I start laughing and laughing because it's just too ridiculous, this nightmare that I'm in. It's like, I, and like that. And I, and I said, that was the funniest thing that ever happened to you. But again, you know, that ability to see the ridiculousness, the, the, the humor in life and be able to reinterpret that uh, and reframe it. I think that's one of the things that got her through, uh, got her through Auschwitz. You've mentioned, and, it. sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, and, and you know, now, you know, one of the things that Mo Mondays is known for is, you know, it's not just the night of storytelling, of intense stories, and oh my God, that would be so boring. Uh, You know, people know that if you can't find the funny in your own story, then you're not past it. And I think that comes from, you know, my mother. You know, know, it sounds ridiculous, but... You know, that little seed of inspiration influenced how I developed uh, this thing, which is now growing across the country. So, and, and if the, and, you know, not that we expect all speakers to be comedians, but I mean, definitely the, the hosts, the mo hosts are, are, are coached and trained to bring that quality of levity to the night. So, Yeah. You've just taken me back to where I was hoping to to steer the conversation next is Mo Mondays, because you've mentioned it now two or three times. And let's take this from the perspective, Michelle, of somebody listening somewhere else around the world that has no idea what we're talking about when we say Mo Mondays. And maybe the best way to be able to do that is to start from where the idea came from. You've dropped a couple seeds of that, and, and it's starting to crystallize in my mind. I'm understanding it better now that you've shared what you have. But to give the idea of where the seeds of those ideas came from and and, and what it turned into as a, a means of helping people to understand what Mo Mondays is and how it came to be. Well, so, you know, all of this that I've been talking about really is in hindsight and retrospect and, and putting, you know, connecting the dots after the fact. Because I, I, I firmly believe, you know, when you look ahead, you, you have no idea where the path is. But when you look behind, you saw you see the road. Yeah. Uh, 
that you came on. So that's 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 the benefit of of hindsight. Uh, when I started Mo Mondays, it's really because I'd already been a professional speaker for a number of years. I'd done my round of all the networking events. Uh, I'd studied stand up comedy and I did my my bit on the stand up comedy open mic stages around town. Um, I've gone to a bunch of, you know, more formal speaker style events, uh, the kind where, you know, they, 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 they talk from the front of the room and try to sell you stuff at the back of the room. I've been to association events and the kind of events where everybody seems to be, uh, you know, dressed in business casual and, and pretending that they're more successful than they really are. And it's really just a facade. Uh, and all of this bugged me, you know, all, all of this really, really bugged me. And I've been to, you know, cause I'm of that generation that was part of all the personal transformational events, you know, and the kind where everybody has to share at the end and everybody has to cry and, and it takes several weekends and several thousand dollars. And, you know, and I, all of those kinds of events and workshops and stuff. And they all bugged me, you know, there was all, they were all, very one dimensional and very superficial or, or not fun, you know, and, and not entertaining and not enjoyable. And I thought to myself, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to put my own little event together. And, and like I said, you know, I'm saying this with the benefit of 2020 hindsight and, and it, believe me, when I started, you know, we literally started on the second floor of a tea room. There were 17 people in the audience, half of which were the speakers. And, you know, the other half was was the serving staff, you know, and, and it started out literally as when I went to an open mic for comedy and one of my friends leaned over to me when I, and she was another speaker slash comic and a way better comic than I was. Uh, and, and she leaned over to me and she said, you know, it'd be, it would be cool to do an open mic, but for speakers. So, you know, as speakers, we could get to practice our bits. And that was, that was the, that was the, 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 the genesis of the idea. I said, Oh, great idea. I'm going to do it. And, you know, do you want to help me? And I never heard from her again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, I ended up doing it. Like I said, we we're on the second floor of a tea room. Uh, 17 people in the audience, half of which were the speakers, the other half was the serving staff, and we started like on that basis. You know, this was going to be an open mic for for my, my friends, professional speakers, and the speaker association. That's what we were going to do. But it didn't take long for me to see everything that I didn't want it to be, and all you know. That's when I realized, oh my God, it's turning into another sales pitch thing i don't want that uh oh my god it's turning into another like standard networking event where everybody has to pretend they're more successful than they really are oh, i don't want that you know and, and oh you know i don't want just like stupid comedy uh not that comedy is stupid because there's some very very insightful comedy but you know it's just I just did, you know, sometimes you go to, you know, these stand up open mics and, uh, and at the end of the night, you go, wow, I we laughed a lot, but what were we laughing at? It was, what did I learn from tonight? You know, it was more like laughter porn than anything else. <laughs> you know, it's just like it was empty. And, uh, and I said, oh yeah, I don't want that. So I started putting rules around it. and by, and you know, as luck should have it, the tea room kicked us out because we weren't bringing enough people. We weren't bringing enough business to their, their establishment, their venue. So they kicked us out. They said, eh, this ain't working for us. So we moved into a, uh, a jazz bar. Now a jazz bar, very different from a tea room, uh, real stage, real lights, real sound system, uh, beautiful backdrop, uh, real food, and and alcohol and and just you know it was the perfect blend of external things that we needed to take us to to a place where we really wanted to be but by that point i had had enough experiences of all the things that i did not want at the tea room i wanted something more meaningful but i also wanted it to be funny and entertaining i wanted it to be uh 
uh, really relaxed and, and natural with nobody putting on airs. Um, and, and I wanted it to be, I started asking my speakers, share a story you've never shared before. You know, tell us something that'll really give us insight into the real you, who you are. Uh, but you know, it does, it's not, it doesn't have to be heavy and, you know, we don't have to cry, although some people do at times. So really a roller coaster of emotions by the end of the night. But, but when I, and I, and I started mixing up the real professional speakers with people who had never shared a story in their life in public, but they knew they had something that was significant or of value to other people, something that they were driven to share. And, and, and that's really when Mo Monday started growing. And it was the combination of, of factors of making it fun and entertaining, but at the same time, truly meaningful. And yeah, I think, I think it was those things. And, and, and now, again, with, with the benefit of an extra five years, of doing this and now spread all over the country. I was like, I, I dig, I, I dig further back. And that's why I started with, you know, I think I've always been driven to express more of myself and, and what better way than to share the personal story of me. And that's the opportunity that we give to everybody. Now there, I, recently I got to tell you Kevin recently I put another piece of the and uh, you know I talked a lot about my mother and I, I'll share you the, the short version of my father who fought in the French Foreign Legion which is everybody knows is you know not you know the, the, the a picnic and uh you know, he always told us that he fired his gun twice. You know, we would ask him for, we were kids, my brother and I, you know, and say, tell us a war story. Well, he'd say, I fired my gun twice, once to kill a chicken, to bring a dinner to my colonel, uh, and, and once to clean it. And he got, you know, Blue Cross of Honor medal with a certificate signed by General de Gaulle. We were all very proud of him. I said, how did you do that? What did you do to get that? And he told us the story of how he had to relay him because he was he was actually had a degree in linguistics at the time. Uh, he was already very educated, but because my dad, so here it gets it gets even stranger and stranger. My dad grew up Jewish Iranian, and you know, kind of partly to escape the anti-Semitism in, in Iran, left, left and joined the French Foreign Legion, ended up escaping because because the, the British. Had, uh, were occupying, quote, on sort of Iran at the time. He put on a British uniform and kind of got on a train and went to Alexandria, Egypt, where he signed up for the French Foreign Legion. And uh, so, you know, he was, he was, oh, but he, by this point, he had been educated in France, spoke French, English, uh, Farsi as well, obviously. And, uh, and he told us that he had to relay a message from the, uh, French to the, I think it was the, 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 the Americans on the other side of a valley and the valley was in plain sight of the Germans that were shooting and he had to crawl on his belly across the entire valley and to deliver this, uh, this message and, uh, and then crawl all the way back on his belly in plain sight of the Germans and, and he made it and that's why he got the medal. Well, you know, it wasn't until long, and my, my dad died when he was just 65. So, you know, a young, young man. <clears throat> and uh, many years later, my uncle told me, you know, your father was involved in some very horrific battles. I said, really? You know, and this is me in, you know, in my, in my late 40s, you know, really? My Really? He never told us that. And, uh, you know, he said, yeah, he's, he, was, uh, he was actually honorably discharged from the army because of what we would now call PTSD. 
And uh, I started doing some research and into his battles and the battles. And, you know, every once in a while he would mention a town in Italy where he fought. And, you know, I discovered that this whole story that he told us about firing his gun twice and crawling across the valley was totally made up. And, uh, you know, in this one, you know, he, and I found citations of him and his regiment where, you know, they were just 200 people and they captured 2,000 prisoners, you know, in horrific battles. And one case particularly where they arrived in this little village in, in Italy. And, uh, and as soon as they arrived, there was machine gun fire from atop uh, a, a, a castle from the Turks and the castle. And, and like his, his friends were like literally falling down on either side of him. And, and his commander asked for six volunteers to scale the back wall of the tower and uh, he volunteered, never expecting to make it out alive. And uh, literally with hammers and, and pittons and rope, they scaled the back wall, got to the top and lobbed some grenades in and, uh, you know, and, and killed everybody up there and saved his, his, his regiment. And, and, you know, I was, I was shocked when my uncle told me this story. I said, yeah, this was, on one hand, it was not the story of my father that he, wa he had led us to believe our entire lives. And yet, and yet it made so much sense because even growing up as a child, I could sense a sadness from my dad. I, I never knew it or understood it. And all of a sudden I said, oh, oh, now I get it. Now I understand. And he had kept this locked up inside him for so long. And it, it, now it may sound, you know, simplistic and facile, but, you know, I, I believe that that, was eating away at him his entire life from the inside because he had never shared it with anybody. And my mother, on the other hand, you know, had a, you know, lived until 87, always vivacious, always outgoing. You know, she, you know, even in her mid eighties, she would, you know, go out of her apartment. She always lived alone right up until the end. And, uh, you know, she would walk out and walk downtown for five kilometers. She wouldn't walk back because it was uphill. <laughs> but, you know, my mom had huge energy. And uh, and how I, like I said, it may sound simplistic, but she was very open. She shared her stories. And she was never afraid to speak out and sometimes inappropriately, but it didn't matter. You know, she was, she was just who she was. And my dad was not. And he passed away at 65 in his sleep, quietly, his heart just stopped. And, uh, and I think, and I think, I, you know, I don't know, like, you know, I don't know, but, you know, coming back to Mo Monday's, I feel like there is there's a, a real human need to share our stories and who we are and it's essential to our 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 personal survival. And the other I mean, there's another factor as well that kind of goes into this and this I kind of figured out a long time ago uh, when we were just starting Mo Mondays, what I realized was that, you know, the more people shared their stories, and the stories were so different. You know, stories of people deciding, like feeling this deep 
see the need to change genders, to 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 overcome the bullying that they experience as a kid, to to growing up in gang member families and all of the stuff and baggage that goes along with that or 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 just you know surviving an accident or i mean or even something simple you know just little, some things that we experience every day the, the the breadth and diversity of stories is incredible and yet at the core of every story is is a universal human element that is undeniable that touches everybody and i you know i don't know i don't i can't say i i designed this this way intentionally but i think in retrospect it comes back to the experience experiences of my parents and and what happened in the war and what continues to happen today all over the world with such incredible uh you know cruelty and 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 prejudice and and tribalism that when we share our personal stories it's it's almost the only time that we become one as a species is it's the only time we are truly only human and when we see people on stage at a Mo Monday stage and they're sharing their story, you know, it doesn't matter whether they're black, white, Asian, Jew, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, atheist, doesn't matter because all those labels strip away and all that's left is human. Michelle, what's the story behind the name of the event? <laughs> Oh, oh man, you made me laugh. Uh, you know, I wish I, it's like everything else I do. You know, I wish I could say I sat down and I engineered it methodically and I masterminded it and I, and I strategized it. And like, you know, in the spirit of full disclosure, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, you know, it really started out by saying, well, you know, what night do we have the best chance of getting a cheap venue? <laughs> oh, Monday. Yeah, so, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> shatter, shatter any illusions you have of, of any brilliance that I, anyway, you know, so that's, you know, so he said, oh, great. Yeah, we'll do it on Monday. Okay. Uh, and we want it to be kind of like motivational, inspirational. Oh, okay. We'll call it motivational Mondays. Let's, oh, let's look online. Let's grab that domain. Oh, man, shit. No motivational Mondays. It's taken. Oh, wait a minute. But Mo Mondays, let's try that. Oh, Mo Mondays is available. Oh, let's buy it. And, you know, now we have it in, you know, dozen or more countries around the world, MoMondays.com, which turned out to be a real stroke of luck, I will say. Not genius. I wish I could claim it, but it's not. But because, you know, there's a lot of there are a lot of preconceptions that people have about motivational speaking. And the one thing that we did not want Mo Mondays to be, I hope you can you could see clearly from now and you the ones that you've been to. We don't want old style hackneyed people who think that they're the next you know, God's gift to the motivational speaking world, you're pulling out all those standard motivational speaking tricks and cavorte court, you know, what, what's the word? <laughs> Exhorting their audience to, you can do it. We don't want that. That's exactly what we don't want. And a lot of people, they use, when we first started, they say, oh, motivational Mondays. Nah, you know what? I'm good. Don't worry. I don't want that. I'm not, it's not my thing. And, I, and it took me a while to figure, what do you mean it's not your thing? It's like, it's, oh, you think it's like, you think it's going to be like one of those kinds of, no, that's, we, I hate those. We don't want those. It's so, so in fact, the name, even though some people who have been around a long time, they still call it Motivational Mondays. I can't get rid of it as much as I'd like to, but it ended up being a liability for us uh, because it stopped 
a lot of the people uh, who would otherwise be interested in coming. Now, it makes it a little bit harder to explain actually what happens there. Uh, but, you know, you really need to come out and, and experience it for yourself. But we ended up just shortening it to Mo Mondays, partly because that's the domain we got, partly because it was convenient. We did, we want to distance ourselves from Motivational Mondays. And it's Mo Mondays. It's a fun name. It's short. It's catchy. It's like I, I couldn't have written it better if I tried, I think, you know, <laughs> but I didn't try. It's just, it's, you know, whatever. What did it look like when you decided to expand it into a second or third or more? I don't know how many came next, but from the the f- initial venue to another city, how did you decide that? Well, listen, I got to tell you, having a, an expansion of Mo Mondays beyond our original city was the furthest thing from my mind. I didn't want to do it. Uh, I, it wasn't on my radar. And it was just another one of those things where, you know, like my friend from Stephanie Staples from Winnipeg, bless her, I love her. Uh, she called me up one day. We'd been doing Mo Mondays for about six, seven months. So the first three months were kind of like, screw that. That's a wash. That was like a learning time. Uh, but we really started getting into our own around six months later. And that's when the audiences started growing. People started hearing about it. People started talking about it. They loved this kind of unique blend of, of comedy and life stories and, and meaningful uh, moments uh, in an entertaining format. They just, they, they love that. And, uh, and my friend Stephanie in Winnipeg kind of was hearing about it as well. And she called me up one day. She said, Michelle, I want to do a Mo Mondays in Winnipeg and you're going to help me. And I said, no, I no, I'm not set up. I don't have systems. I don't I can't help you do that. It's like, no, and I don't want to, you know, they, I, I'm happy just doing it here in Toronto. Let, leave me alone. Uh, like I, I, I'm not kidding. I'm, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating it one little bit. And, but she's persistent and you don't say no to Stephanie. And so finally I said, okay, but if I do it in another city, uh, I'm going to put, you know, systems and procedures and and package it up in a way that other people could do it too, because that's the only way it's going to be worthwhile for me to do it. And you know, if I'm going to support you, I'm going to. And and bless her, she said, you know, Michelle, I'll help you do that because really, I Mo Mondays needs to be around the world. It, it brings such a a, a, a literally a, a breath of, of of humanity into the world, and. You know, I'm going to get on my 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 platform a little bit again. I, I I truly believe, and again, this is in retrospect, that when we share our personal stories, we're actually taking that little step towards world peace because of what I said earlier. Is that all the labels strip away? We see that you know, in the, you know, doesn't matter what culture you've been to, you 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 come from. We've all had that. We're all we all have that little child in, inside us that is bursting to get out and and and. You know, be told it's going to be okay, and we're okay. You know, that's that's really, and it does anyway. So, so that's what happened. So we did it in Winnipeg, and then uh, because I'm part of this professional speaker association, you know, a bunch of other friends said, "Hey, I want to do this in not my city." All right, I want to do. That. I said, "Okay," <laughs> and uh, we started formalizing the processes and really putting. You know, I've since then I've written like a hundred page. Uh, operations manual uh, that covers, you know, best practices in every single little area of of that you can imagine in running a, a, a Mo Mondays, even down to things that you know I learned through trial and error, like how to how to arrange the table. You know what? You know you go uh, like here's what happens: we go to a new venue and they say, "Oh, I know what you want. You want cabaret style," and we say, "No, we don't." And, and what I notice, what I realize, and again in retrospect, is that everybody comes at this with a preconceived notions of this is just another, you know, networking event style thing, and it's not. Or, and uh, so we we really go into into uh, you know the fine points of how to how to arrange the tables to encourage social interaction without awkward interaction where 
you know, everybody feels like, you know, they've, we, we've been, you know, ex- where, where they feel they have to exchange business cards and give their elevator pitch. And I hate that. <laughs> I don't want that. So not, not that people do it. People make incredible business connections at Mo Mondays, but it happens because they connect human to human first. And, and, and again, that's one of those learnings that I, that I realized after the fact. You know, I tell people, you know, leave your business cards in your pocket. And I don't really mean that. Uh, and of course, people exchange business cards. But the emphasis is on, you know, we're, we're all here because, because we have this piece of us inside us that is that wants to be wants to come out and we appreciate that in others and we're supportive of that in others and we also want to laugh and have fun and enjoy ourselves and since those early days and again it was one of uh, stephanie's uh, stephanie's ideas her her innovation was we started mixing in musicians as well so now it really is if you could if you could imagine a cross between uh personal inspirational storytelling with with comedy and live music all kind of like bashed together or or you would say in a mashup you know that's what mo mondays is so it's meaningful fun and entertaining all at the same time it's and so I, it's pretty cool i think it's pretty cool but i'm but i'm biased <laughs> tell me about before our um our time together runs up there are a whole lot of other things that we can be talking about and we're not going to have the time to do proper justice to them all. But Mo Mondays I, I've taken as something that has weaved itself into the experience of Michelle Naray that already was kind of a vast cornucopia <laughs> of different things <laughs> um, from science to uh, marketing and copywriting to uh, inventing you know, online searchable directories to yeah. authoring and the speaking and the coaching that you do. Tell me about some of the other things that you consider to have been really essential, essential in your experience so far. Well, absolutely. It's, 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 uh, you know, I still call myself a professional copywriter. I, I don't do it much. I still do it, but not a lot for other people. Uh, and, and the copywriting, my skill as a copywriting Actually, I trace back to my, again, my childhood and being a shy child, introverted child, uh, that was very observant of people. And I started dissecting and deconstructing language, what works, what doesn't work. And and also, you need to have a playful side of you if you're going to be a, a copywriter. You can't, you know, like some the best ideas come out of uh, a joke or a laugh or something totally, you know, I talk about the you know, the, the seven stages of creativity where stage six is when you get so it's so late at night and you're so you're punch drunk, you know, you can't don't make any sense. And you say something absolutely stupid. And then the next stage is, oh, wait a minute. I think there's an idea there. <laughs> and, and you know, so and that's my my skill as a as a copywriter. Um and you know, I've grown up through the the advertising world. I've written radio commercials, TV commercials, you know, billboards, magazine copy, short copy, brochure copy, homepage copy. You, you know, you name it. I've I've written I've written scripts. I've written letters from the president. I've written you know annual reports. And you know, I've I, you know I'm, I'm a good I, I think I'm, I'm a good communicator. I'm a good writer. And I think that has very much weaved itself into uh, Mo Mondays. One of the things that I think we're really, really strong in is the branding of Mo Mondays. Because I wasn't clear three months in, as, as you know already by now, I wasn't clear about what Mo Mondays was or what I wanted it to be or what it should be. I had no idea. I just did it because I wanted to do it. I did it because I was tired of all those other things. But it wasn't, it wasn't clearly articulated in my head at the time. But... By making the mistakes that we did, it became absolutely clear about what we didn't want. And that helped me narrow the focus. And and that, I, it felt like it was a long process. But in, in retrospect, we, we did that very quickly. We did that all within the first eight months. 
And, uh, and then it was my skill as a branding guy to, and, a, and a writer to put all the materials together and write the websites. And we came up with a line, you meet the nicest people at Momandi. You know, we came up with two lines, you know, real people, real stories, real inspiration, which is the official tagline. And then I wrote a headline once, you meet the nicest people at Momandi's. And I literally, I wrote it because I'm a copywriter and I just wrote it. And, but, you know, that's the line that everybody remembers. And that's the line that people that people play back to me, uh, you know, even from the entire audience. You know, they'll they'll say, in, in, you know, you can meet the nicest people at Momandi's. And so you could say that's that, you know, you could say it's serendipity. You could say it's it's, you know, it's like we're like. I called it Mo Mondays, you know, maybe my skill, maybe, maybe I should give myself a little bit more credit. It's not, yeah, yeah, all of these things happen. And I feel like I, I didn't know what I was doing. And it was just by chance that we ended up having Mo Mondays.com available as a domain name. But I guess if any credit is due, it was just my ability to recognize that, oh, this is good. I don't know where it came from, but it's good. And that line, you meet the nicest people at Mondays. You know, I don't, I don't worry. I can't even remember even writing it, or when I write, wrote it. But you know, it became. I said, "Yeah, that's good." And 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 the more we do Mondays, the more I realize how true it is because it's almost like a self fulfilling prophecy. The people who are interested in having this experience of this unique blend of meaningful stories with a laugh and music are self-selective <laughs> we're, we're like this is like we've all found found our tribe together we are to each other anyway we are the nicest people so you know i don't know does that does that, <laughs> does that help you at all it does I, i'm i'm interested in Given the fact that we've, in my opinion anyway, Michelle, barely scratched the surface of the collective experience and creative offerings of Michelle Nuray, um, I'm interested, though, from this point about what are the things that really kind of jazz you most and uh, uh, where you are now and what's kind of percolating in between your ears and in your spirit that uh, you're curious about that's um, continuing to pull you forward? Yeah, so, uh, you know, in the last five years, <clears throat> I've really seen how Mo Mondays can be a vehicle of, of change, of transformational change, not just for the people who come, but there's so much ripple effect that happens. Uh, and I, and I, I, I'm, there's beyond the, any shadow, any doubt how incredibly powerful like i make light of it and, and we have fun and it's and i'll never leave that i think those are really important um uh, inputs and outputs of mo mondays but never for a minute doubt the transformational value of these shows and we call them shows not events for a reason uh they're transform transformational for for the speaker for the storyteller because as much as people think they have their story now, oh, yeah, I know my story. Don't worry. I know my story. You know, when, when you have to package it up in 10 minutes and share it publicly with the universe, it changes you. It makes you peel back some layers that you didn't know were there when you started. And it makes you understand yourself and your life and your place in the world at a much deeper and more significant level than you've ever thought possible. And I've seen that over and over again. So transformational value of, of doing Mo Mondays as a storyteller, as someone who gets on stage, is absolutely huge. And, and for the audience, it's huge as well. Everybody in the audience, first of all, we recognize that everybody has value. You know, it's not just, we don't need to get hire a guru from halfway around the world and pay them to come and speak to us. You know, the, the most inspirational person could be the person, could be you for the next, for the person sitting next to you. And the stories that we hear, we take them back to our offices, to our homes. And, and there's that ripple effect. And so all the values that we say we hold dear, you know, like, 
like non-judgmental, you know, uh, attitudes like positivity, like like openness, like uh, like compassion and empathy, and all of these things that we we say we 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 want and more of in the world, we're actually doing it. We're br- because people are bringing it back to. You know, people are bringing it back to their places of business, their families, their people come and people come not just, you know, people come as teams. Uh, you know, the, we've had, you know, teams from companies show up and, you know, for a for a fun night out that has a little bit more meaning. People have, you know, couples have come for date night. People have come for to celebrate birthdays and anniversaries, you know, because it's fun and entertaining. They wouldn't do that if it were just you know, and now we're going to share and everybody's going to cry type of event. And, you know, they wouldn't do that. But because we're almost making it more mainstream, we're bringing these values into the mainstream. And so for me, having this real personal sense of just how incredibly powerful this is, I'm, I'm on a mission to spread this around the world. And I don't know how to do that yet. I don't think we have the right business model yet. And, and I, I, I just don't know how to do that. Uh, but that's, that's my mission. You know, I, I, we, we need this, we need this in more places. Um, can you imagine what would happen if, if we're able to, have this this kind of meaningful sharing in places and society that are actually uh, driven by conflict. And people could see each other, not by their labels, but by the humanness that we all share. So you ask me, uh, you ask me what, what drives me going forward? What do I see? I say, that's it. And at the same time, for me, never stop evolving. Never, never accept the box that you're in as as the box that you will be in tomorrow. So I'm I'm expanding it. I'm I'm and I'm expanding myself, my own expressiveness within it. Uh, as you know, as we talked about before, I, you know, uh, I've always had a lifelong uh, passion for music, and uh, we're bringing more music into it and. You know, I'm 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 now exploring my own songwriting and and uh, and uh, and singing and 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 playing music, uh, expanding that uh, both within Mo Mondays as well as outside. Just had my first quote unquote show, which was kind of cool and nerve wracking. Funny, you know, we, we we've had tons of of, of really high profile professional musician to have been on thousands of stages and they get on Mo Mondays sharing a personal story and I could see them and you know I'm like where is that confidence that I know you had? Hmm. Where where is that, you know, like that assuredness on stage that I know I've seen you a thousand times and you know, and I never quite got that sharing a personal story was such a totally different experience for them. Uh, that they might as well have been on stage for the first time in their lives. And, you know, I, I, I kind of had that experience myself this week uh, when I was on stage, in, not on a Mo Monday stage, but on a separate stage doing my first show as a musician. I said, oh, my God, shoes on the other foot now. I know what it feels like. I get it. Anyway, so you asked me what, you know, I'm, I, I don't know where, I don't know where this will take me. Uh, I just know that, we're not stopping here. Well, for all we know, Michelle, the next Stephanie Staples, but somewhere around the world that does maybe think they have some of the answers that you don't feel you have yet. Uh, maybe they're listening to this. Who knows? And and yeah. in the meantime, anybody that is part of or has been touched by or attended or participated in a Mo Mondays, I hope they have the opportunity to be able to find this. It's really a pleasure to to hear you tell more of of the story because it throws it into a a completely deeper context for me. And I'm sure that'll be the same for, for anybody else that listens to this conversation. And you've honored me with your time and and no doubt you, you've honored yourself. And, and certainly I'm, I'm hearing your parents as well, Michelle. I, I I think it's um, wonderful that you have, you have acted and lived with so much of them in your heart 
and not only continue to discover more about yourself, but it sounds like um, about yourself through them and them as well. And uh, that really kind of ties it all back around everything that I, I, I think that you're you're talking about. And uh, I really, really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much for this. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much. If you would like to connect with Michelle, you can do that on his website. You can find that at nerea.com. I'll spell his last name for you. N-E-R-A.com. Nerea.com is his official web home. All his social media channel links are listed there on the contact page, but I'll give them to you here so that you have them handy. On Facebook, you can find him at facebook.com slash On Twitter, his handle is at Essential Michelle. And Michelle is M I C H. E L twitter.com slash essential Michelle and M Nuray is the handle on his YouTube channel. Or if you go to youtube.com and you put in Michelle Nuray, you'll find him there. Mo Mondays. You can learn more about that at Mo Mondays.com. And Mo is just M O no E like the bartender from the Simpsons. It's just M O M O N D A Y S Mo Mondays.com. And by the way, I'll be speaking at Mo Mondays in Kitchener, Ontario, on August the 21st, here of 2017, when we're releasing this episode. So if you're listening to this in 2018 or sometime in the future, <laughs> don't go to Mo Mondays. Well, do go to Mo Mondays in Kitchener in August. It probably won't be the 21st anymore. Uh, but don't go expecting to see me there because I probably won't be there. Wouldn't that be a trip if I was? But I know it won't be the 21st. Uh, and in Guelph, which is another city in Ontario, I will be there on December the 18th here in 2017. So in Kitchener... On Monday, August 21st, and in Guelph on Monday, December 18th, I'll be speaking and doing a little bit of a talk on what it means to be the no schedule man. So if you're in that area, would love if you came out and said hi, and uh, we can spend a little bit of time together. I know that we've got a lot of listeners from around southwestern Ontario, Canada, so maybe, you never know, maybe we get to meet each other that way. If you liked this episode with Michelle Nure, I think you're also really going to enjoy episode 52 from a few weeks ago. It's called Finding Who You Really Are Versus the Role You Play. That's with Andre Radmal, who is a, a coach from the United Kingdom. And Andre has a really unique way of working with people, bringing his love of theater into it and helping people step into roles so that they can actually step more into who they really are. Quite a fascinating discussion and methodology, I thought, and it made me think of Michelle. Or rather, while I was talking to Michelle, I thought about the conversation with Andre. Look for that. It's episode 52. I think you'll like it. Also, the one the week before that, episode 51, Discovering a Deeper Why. With Jerry Visca, the why guy. He is on a mission to inspire one million whys around the world, basically helping people to understand why they are here on earth. What's their purpose here in life and why do they exist? Quite an interesting discussion. And another one I thought of was episode 37. This is one that I did that's just me. Just me talking. (laughs) Maybe that turns you off automatically. But it's called What's Tougher? Getting Started or Moving Through the Middle? Here's why I thought of that episode while I was considering what you might like if you like the story with Michelle. With what he was talking about of forming Mo Mondays, getting it started, and then having it morph and change as Stephanie Staples reached out to him and gave him something to consider about expanding it into different cities. Well, then Michelle was faced with a whole bunch of challenges that he hadn't really counted on. So getting started, it kind of creates its own inertia. Now you're moving forward. But at a certain point, whenever you begin something new, you're going to end up sort of in the the messy middle bit. bit. What do we do now? And how do we even know that we're in the middle, especially when there is no real definable end? And it's those that push through that time when you're kind of in the fog and you're not really sure (laughs) exactly what to do next that I think makes it an interesting question. What's harder, to get started or to keep going? That's in episode 37. I thought I'd mention it here. You can find those in all other archived episodes of the No Schedule Man podcast on iTunes or at noschedulemanpodcast.com. And I'd love if you would take a moment to subscribe, share it, leave a comment, a rating, or review. I'd love to hear from you and know what you think. And in the meantime, you can reach me at kevinbolmer.com. 
NoScheduleman.com takes you to the same place. All my social media channel links are up there, as is the sign-up for my email list. Please do keep in touch, and I hope that you'll join me on this journey and add your voice to mine. Thank you again for taking the time to listen and to share part of your day with me. I'm grateful. I hope to have you back with me next week as we explore another journey on the No Schedule Man podcast. Just a little deja vu. 